Hello and welcome back to Soteriology 101. Today we're going to play a clip from John Piper going over the doctrine of election from his perspective. But before we go there, I want to give a quick overview and a lesson on the three different views of election uh, historically two of which I believe are both biblical, they're not either or type concepts, but one which is the Calvinistic view of election, which is of course something I don't believe is biblically founded. But I wanna be fair as I can in representing Calvinists, which is why almost in every episode you'll hear me play a Calvinistic clip for themselves. I want you to hear them for what they teach. I'm often accused of misrepresenting Calvinism. That's not my intention, that's why I play them for themselves, something that very rarely Calvinists do on their own broadcast, play the best of our scholars for ourselves. Instead, oftentimes Calvinists, in, at least in my experience, uh, paint Calvinists, uh, paint all non-Calvinists of believing in some kind of a weird foresight faith, God traveling into time on a DeLorean, as Matt Chandler put it, and others uh, paint it in this most ridiculous way possible. Um, I, I'm not doing that. Um, now, you may accuse me of a lot of different things, but I, I think I'm at least being as fair, if not more fair, than most of the leading uh, scholarly Calvinists in our world today, uh, at least on the broadcast that I've been listening to. Now, if you want to send me a uh, uh, examples of where uh, well-known Calvinists have represented the provisionist or traditionalist uh, Southern Baptist perspective in a, in a robust way, I would love to hear it, and I would, uh, I would uh, give them much uh, praise and thanks for their willingness to go out of their way and paint our view uh, in the most correct light and in the most uh, realistic light as possible. And um, so I, I, I want you to hear from John Piper here in a second, but I want you to have a, a, a kind of a framework on which to base his answers and his arguments on. Because as David Allen has said before, and I have continually said, Calvinists have the same vocabulary, but a very different dictionary. And so they say a lot of things that sound a lot like what we would say, but they mean something different than what we mean. And that's why you have to go through these things very carefully to understand the underpinning of the Calvinistic worldview uh, and, and the philosophical underpinning of what's called compatibilism uh, in, in the sense of God is ultimately determining your desires and your nature, uh, either from birth due to the fall of Adam and God has decreed that all people will be born in a condition that they cannot reply positively to his appeals to be reconciled from that fall. That's God's decision. Adam did not have the power to make all of his children uh, become totally morally incapable of responding even to God's own appeals to be reconciled. That has to be something God decided. So they may say it's natural or it's a natural condition of man. Well, what is nature if not something decreed by God on, on Calvinism? So to call it natural doesn't remove the culpability or the, the, the choice, uh, the decree of God in the process. In other words, he's the one who decided the consequences of the fall, which would be that all people would become, uh, according to Calvinism, incapable, morally speaking, incapable of willingly or wanting to receive the gospel when it's brought. I don't find this anywhere established in the pages of scripture. And that is the T of total inability, the T of their tulip. Now the second letter, the U of tulip, refers to unconditional election. And that is the first view I want us to look at in the, the three different views of election. This is the individual election. In other words, individuals, a very westernized approach, by the way, uh, not to see things from a more familial or corporate perspective, but from a, a very western individualized perspective. Because we as westerners tend to read things through the individual lens, the me, I, my. We don't see the, whenever we hear the word you, uh, we don't hear y'all as in the Texas, Texas uh way of putting it, or up, up north, use guys, uh, they would say they, that when you hear the word you in scripture, most often we hear the individual you. Um, we don't hear the plural y'all. And that sometimes leads us to misunderstanding certain passages of scripture. For example, when Paul says to predominantly Gentile churches as the apostle to the Gentiles, I praise God that from before the foundation of the world, but from the beginning, he's chosen you. They hear God has chosen you individually versus the way I would hear that is God has chosen you, the Gentile people, from the very beginning. This has been God's plan to graft in you. So even though the Judaizers and all of those uh, people out there are saying, no, we are the elect, the Jews are the elect, in order to become a, a, a Jew, in order to become a Christian, a follower of Christ, you've got to become a Jew first. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to follow these laws. And Paul is fighting back. No, God has chosen you from the beginning, and you're not being grafted in through works, i.e. circumcision and following of the law, you're being grafted in through faith. And so it's by faith that you're justified through the meritorious work of Christ himself. So you're not meriting salvation by believing in God. You are being given by grace the merit of Christ's righteousness and his atoning work onto your account because of your belief. 
So because you believed, you are credited with righteousness. So it's not meriting your own righteousness by believing. Instead, it's being given the righteousness of Christ by grace through faith for all who believe. And so this contradicts what Calvinists teach with regard to individual election to effectual salvation. So the individuals are chosen, and they're chosen for what? To be effectually changed, given a new nature, regenerated, some of them will say quickened, and then those are the people who are going to believe unto salvation. So this is the, the way in which the Calvinistic uh, system has interpreted the biblical doctrine of election. And so if I were to give an explanation, it would be like this. God unconditionally chose certain individuals to receive a special irresistible grace, which would cause them effectually or irresistibly cause them to believe and thus be saved. And so the way sometimes they'll put it is that God picks certain individuals, he opens their eyes. If their eyes are not opened, if they, they, they were born shut, and if they remain shut throughout their entire life, they're re re willingly re rejecting the gospel because they don't want the gospel because their nature is such that they couldn't want the gospel according to the Calvinistic system. And so God unconditionally or without any regard to the individual whatsoever, um, he chooses, uh, I would say arbitrary based upon the definition of arbitrary. Calvinists don't like that term because it carries some not negative connotations, but I, I think the word arbitrary applies here, that God would arbitrarily choose certain people over others and they, these people are given a certain special kind of irresistible grace uh, uh, that, that opens their eyes, that regenerates their heart, that makes them into a, a new person so that they will believe. And this is where I believe, of course, the Calvinists get the cart before the horse because ultimately you've got people being given a new heart in order to confess that they had a bad heart. And I think that that's honestly just cart before horse. It's just the wrong order. The Bible says to confess your sins and so as to receive a new heart out of Ezekiel 18. In other words, uh, humble yourselves, admit your wrongdoing, admit the corruptness of your heart so as to be redeemed, so as to be reconciled. It's, it's, in, it, it's in confessing and admitting your uh, need that you're given um, the, the solution to that need. It's not the other way around. You're not, you're not given the solution to that need, i.e. regeneration, so as to admit that you used to be beforehand uh, somehow corrupt, but now that you've been made new, now you know that you've, it just, it just messes up the entire order of the scriptures. And so that, that's the individual election to effectual salvation perspective. So whenever Calvinists hear the term election or choice or God's choosing, this is what automatically pops in their mind that before the foundation of the world, God individually picked certain people to be given this effectual grace and that these people's eyes would be opened at some undisclosed time in life for undis some undisclosed reason, that these people's eyes would just be made open when they hear the gospel and they will believe it irresistibly. They will be drawn to the beauty of who Christ is, they'll say, things like this. And so this is the individual election to salvation view that you're going to hear Piper expound upon here in this question and answer uh, program in just a moment. But I want to give, again, the, just the underpinning of the different views. Now, the second view of election is, I believe, a biblically-based view, um, and that is the individual election to service perspective. Now, I don't believe that this is um, the only biblical view of election. In other words, I believe there are times which it is clearly true that God has chosen an individual to fulfill a particular service. In fact, you could even say Judas was elect, okay? Uh, you could say Pharaoh was elect. The Bible says, I've chosen you, for, I've raised you, Pharaoh, up for this very purpose that my power might be displayed through you. So he was elect. Elect for what? Not elect for salvation. It was an individual elect for a purpose that the power of God would be displayed through his rebellious actions. So God, knowing Pharaoh's heart or Judas's heart, knew that they would rebel in the given circumstances and used their rebellion, like the police sting analogy we used before, a police officer knowing that drug dealers are going to sell drugs. He knows the intentions of their heart. He knows their uh, character. And he knows that if given in a certain circumstance, a sting type operation, or in a circumstance of, 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 of being placed where, where Christ is at the particular time, a particular place, where, or in Pharaoh's situation where he, he blinds them or gives them over to his already calloused heart so as to accomplish his purpose of redemption through them. Okay, so that individual is chosen for a particular redemptive good, maybe for good or for bad, but it's for a service. It's for a redemptive good. So Jacob is said to be chosen 
Um, that's oftentimes idiomatically what was used with regard to uh, the I hate you versus I love you was regarded to I choose this one over this one. And so I've chosen Jacob to be the seed through which the, the, the nation would be blessed, the nations of the earth would be blessed. I've chosen Jacob, who whose name is changed to Israel, which, by the way, the, the root word of the word Israel uh, really refers to kind of a prince, in a sense, almost the, the, in, a, in a sense of the son of the king, the one who is a, a specially appointed person to be a spokesman for the king. And so Israel, in a sense, is, becomes a spokesman for the king, for God. And he becomes, the, the Israel becomes the, the mouthpiece of God, in a sense, that the law, the prophets, the messengers of God are chosen from this nation. And so Jacob is chosen for that noble or honorable use to be the message through which the king would deliver his truth, the gospel. That's why he says in his promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 3 and following, that through you, your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so those who bless you, I will bless them. Those who curse you, I will curse them, which is why he says to the, the seed of uh, Esau um, in, in Malachi, these, uh, that, that, that his seed, the Edomites, are hated. Why? Because they stood against the people of God, the, the Israelites. They fought against them. They came to battle with them, and therefore they were under the curse of God, his hatred. So it's not an arbitrary hate, hatred before the world began. That would contradict his, his command in Deuteronomy. Do not hate the Edomites, for they are your brother, he says to the Israelites. So God's not arbitrarily just hating Esau and his descendants. He's, he's cursing them because they stood against the promises of God. But those who bless you, I will bless. That's a conditional promise. If you believe, if you trust, then you will to be blessed. And so that's the, the concept and understanding we've got to understand that God has individually chosen Jacob, for example. He individually chose uh, Isaiah or Ezekiel. He individually chose Paul. He could have chose Gamaliel. You remember Gamaliel? He was Paul's teacher uh, in the Jewish custom. He could have chose Gamaliel to be one of the apostles, couldn't he have? Of course he could have. He chose Paul to be one of the apostles. Does that necessarily therefore mean that, that um, Paul was a better, more deserving person? He, he deserved to be chosen more than Gamaliel because he was more moral? Well, Paul obviously wasn't very moral. He was trying to stone the Christians of his day. And so he wasn't chosen based upon his morality. He was chosen to bring a redemptive message to the rest of the world. Jonah is a good Old Testament example of this. He was chosen to go to a Gentile nation, the Ninevites. He was not a moral person, obviously. Look what he did. He ran the other direction. So he wasn't chosen because he was more moral or a better uh, prophet than somebody else, but he was chosen. And notice God has to use um, effectual external means, if you will. I don't know if you'd even call them effectual, but they're obviously sufficient, but they're external means to convince the rebellious will of his messenger to make sure he goes to where he doesn't want to go. But proof, as we've talked about dozens of times on this program, proof that God uses external and um, persuasive means like a big fish or with Paul, a blinding light, to convince his messengers to take the message where he wants it doesn't prove that God uses some kind of inward, irresistible means to make certain pre-chosen people believe that message when he arrives. Uh, so when Jonah gets to Nineveh, for example, we, we can't assume that God is using some kind of secret, irresistible means to make certain Ninevites believe Jonah's message when he gets there based upon the fact that he chose Jonah and used a fish to convince him to go there. Does that make sense? And so you'll hear, uh, you know, on, on Calvinistic sites and things like this, you'll see memes of Paul being blinded off his horse or Jonah being swallowed by a well. Look, these guys didn't have free will. This proves Calvinism. And, and I'm just like, okay, guys, he's using an external means, not internal irresistible regeneration. He's using an external means like a blinding light and big fish to convince one of his own Israelite people. So that's not unconditional. <laughs> they are Israelites that he's choosing to be the mouthpiece. And he's choosing a flawed vessel like Jonah, like Paul, not based upon their morality. So it's unconditional in the sense that it's not conditioned on their moral uh, worthiness. Um, and he chooses them to be a messenger, to take the, the message to the highways, to the byways, to the good, the bad, the like. So he's chosen these individual servants to fulfill a particular service. You can't take those passages out of their context, like John 15, 16. You did not choose me, I chose you. Who is he speaking to? His apostles, 
who he's shown miraculous signs to, like walking on water, like healing the dead in front of them, uh, like bl- uh, healing the blind in front of him. Uh, like Thomas, he's saying, look at my nail-scarred hands. You believe. Blessed are those who don't see and still believe. There's a difference between how he has called out his messengers from Israel to fulfill the service that he has ordained them to fulfill, that he's chosen the nation to fulfill. There's a difference between that and individual sociological election. And the Calvinists do not draw a distinction very well in some of the passages they use to apply to their sociological worldview. And you've got to understand this in order to understand that when when Calvinists pluck verses out of their context, like John 15, 16, and not all the Calvinists do this. As a matter of fact, uh, I think Kevin, it was on the Facebook page, uh, posted a clip of John, uh, excuse me, uh, James White uh, actually rebuking other Calvinists who use John 15, 16 soteriologically because he actually acknowledges uh, which I'm glad he acknowledges John 15, 16 is not about individual's choice of salvation, but about the individuals being chosen for apostleship. And so um, so, some Calvinists do acknowledge that, and I'm I'm grateful for that. But there are plenty of other Calvinists. We've played a a message by John Piper and others who are using John 15, 16 and other passages like that as a, a proof text for individual election to effectual salvation. And that's just a misapplication of the scripture. Now, some people may say, well, if you hold to the individual election to service view, then you can't, you can't also hold to the corporate election to salvation view. And I, I take issue with this. Um, I've actually written an article uh, kind of in response to Brana Bishano's um, response to um, Schreiner, uh, who is a Calvinistic scholar out of Southern. And I, I take some issue with this because I don't think it's an either or perspective when it comes to the election to service versus the, the corporate view of, a, 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 of election. Um, and so let me explain what I mean by that. Under the individual election to service view, what I wrote is this. God chose certain individuals to serve a purpose in his redemptive plan. Even those who hold to the corporate view of election have to acknowledge this and believe this. And I, and I think that they ultimately would if, if confronted. Do you believe, in other words, that individually Paul was chosen to be a messenger? Yes. Do you believe Jonah was individually chosen to be a messenger? Well, yes. Do you believe Pharaoh was raised up and chosen to, um, uh, through his rebellious words, that, that God's redemptive plan would be fulfilled through him? Yes. God chooses individuals for service for a particular um, thing that he wants to accomplish in and through them. Can and does he do this? Yes, he does. So you can't negate the election to service understanding because there are times that God has elected certain people to service. And even those who hold to this view over here, the, the Calvinistic view, should and would acknowledge that. Like we, we mentioned with James White, he does acknowledge there are individuals chosen to be apostles that aren't uh, then others are passed by in the sense that they're not all chosen to be apostles. Um, and so there is an election to service perspective, even for the Calvinist. So you can't ignore or overlook this. The, the problem is, is that whenever these verses that have to do the, with certain people being chosen for a particular good or service, that those verses are wrongly applied to support individual election to salvation. And that has to be called out for the error that it is. Now, the corporate election to salvation view can also be held in conjunction with the election to service perspective. It's just simply a question of what is the Bible talking about in this particular context? What what is he referring to? So what is the corporate election to salvation view? Some people, listen to me, this is very crucial. I used to do this when I was a Calvinist. They would I used to, here's what I did. I would dismiss the entire corporate election to salvation perspective because I would say things like, well, corporations are made up of individuals too. So whatever is true of the nation has to be true of the individuals. And so it's all the same thing anyway. And so you can't really escape individual election to effectual salvation by appealing to corporate, the corporate national heads because individuals make up nations. Okay. Listen, if that you think that somehow dismisses the corporate view of election, then you have not yet understood the corporate view of election because there is nothing about the corporate view of election that's negating the individuals. Please hear that. We, we acknowledge the individuals that are being selected for service. We acknowledge that individuals are elect in the sun in so much as one is individually chosen to be made holy and blameless based upon him being under the headship of Christ through faith. 
And so individuals are just as much involved. It's a, it's a matter of whether you're approaching it from the corporate perspective or from the individual perspective first and foremost. So what I wrote here is God chose Christ and decided beforehand that all who are sealed in him by faith would be adopted, made holy and blameless, and conformed into the image of the chosen one. So Christ is the elect one. He is the son. He is the elect one, the chosen one, the second Adam. You can either be under the first Adam, under the flesh, and be under condemnation and wrath, or you can be under the second Adam, Christ, and be under his grace. And whether you're under Adam or under Christ, what's the difference? Faith. Okay, that's the difference. They're going to be both immoral people in heaven and immoral people in hell. Okay, so it's not based upon morality. It's based upon faith. And so if you believe in Christ, you're placed under him through faith, then you are chosen. You're sealed in him, the chosen one, to be made holy and blameless. So you've been predestined to sanctification. You've been predestined to adoption, something we eagerly await for with the redemption of our bodies, as Romans chapter 8 says. And we are going to be conformed into the image of Christ, because that's what God has predetermined, predestined for whosoever is in him through faith. So that's the three different views side by side. You have to decide, as a free will creature yourself, which of these three views is being taught in Scripture. I believe the second one, one there in the middle, is clearly seen, which even Calvinists acknowledge under their view. And I believe that the third view here uh, on, right, I guess it would be, uh, corporate election to salvation. So God chose Christ and decided beforehand that all who are sealed in him by faith, so faith is your responsibility, Ephesians 1.13, they would be adopted, they would be made wholly blameless that all who are in Christ are conformed into the image of his son, but it's your responsibility as to whether you put your faith in Christ or you suppress the truth and unrighteousness and grow hardened and callous to his truth to the point where you could be given over like Pharaoh was, like Judas was. And God may even use you in your rebellion to accomplish a good purpose through you, but that's not because God didn't love you, didn't provide for you, or didn't want you, okay? That's the, the important side, that's the practical side of the Calvinistic uh, understanding of Scripture, is that Judas and, and Pharaoh and the others that we know to uh, have died in, in, their, in their unbelief or died in rebellion or are separated from God, that ultimately, if you're consistent in the Calvinistic worldview, you have to say, well, God didn't send Jesus to die for that person. God did not want that person to come to redemption. God did not provide the necessary means for that person to believe and to be saved because they were born in a condition they could not have ultimately done anything other than what they did because God destined them to remain in unbelief due to their fallen condition from birth that they have no control over. And that, I think, is intuitively known to be wrong. It, it removes the blameworthiness of Pharaoh. It removes the blameworthiness of, of Judas um, because it removes, ultimately, their ability to respond to the revelation of God, uh, morally speaking. And I think that that has to be stood up against very clearly. And so when we talk about the, the different views of election, I want us to understand this before we listen now to, to John Piper. Because in John Piper's perspective here, I think you'll hear um, kind of why, when he's asked this question, can a elect person die without hearing the gospel? It really begins to unpack itself real clearly uh, why this doesn't work. So let's listen to, the, to his broadcast. Can an elect person die without ever having heard the gospel? Or is this impossible? It's a question from a listener named Christy. Hello, Pastor John. Can someone who is elect die without ever hearing the gospel and believing? I suspect not. I understand that people are born elect, but they are not born saved. So the hearing will happen. It must happen. And our sharing of the faith is essential because God uses human means to bring people to himself. However, if people die without getting the chance to hear and respond to the gospel, I suspect they were never elect. Is that right? I am a seminary student and will be going overseas as a missionary upon graduation. I feel the missionary urgency, and yet I cannot shake this question. If the people who don't hear were not elected, what is the urgency of sharing the faith? Do you see how that logic would deter the missionary impulse? Yes. I okay, stop there. Understand the question, and notice he confirms that he understands how that logic 
could lead to a lack of missionary fervency, right? He acknowledges, yes, that can happen. In fact, Sam Storms, uh, who works with John Piper and part of his board there at, at Desiring God Ministries, who is a fellow Calvinist there in Oklahoma, um, he writes about this, and he says that that which historically has separated biblical Calvinism from hyper-Calvinism is the denial by the latter of the external gospel. Hyper-Calvinists explain, and he goes on and gives a quote from a hyper-Calvinist, that the, the preaching of the gospel um, is really not necessary because he or elect or elect, and God's going to save who is going to save. And so the hyper-Calvinists become hyper, and they become like the frozen chosen, have you heard it said, or something of that nature. Um, and, and, and what Piper does is he does, I mean, as Sam Storms, they're standing against hyperism, which is ultimately don't take Calvinism so logically that you become a hyper-Calvinist and start saying, well, God's going to save who is going to save fatalistically in a sense. Um, but here's the problem with that, which we'll talk about a little, little bit more in depth later. Those who become hyper in their Calvinistic logic are becoming hyper in their Calvinistic logic because that's what God decreed. Okay? So follow this. I mean, he says, Piper says in his other writings, everything that happens happens according to God's decree. So in the past, these people who became um, uh, hyper Calvinist in the past, it says, notice it says this view was held by Congregational and Baptist ministers. This is Sam Storms again in England during the 17th and 18th centuries. It's not to say, however, that no one who embraces the view today, including uh, those, and he mentions um, uh, Brian and Hussey and Wyman and all these hyper Calvinists of the past. In other words, remember what James White told us. We don't know what the decree is in the future, but we do know based upon what's happened in the past because everything that's happened is in accordance with what God has sovereignly and unchangeably decreed. God has brought this to pass according to his purpose. Piper agrees with this. He's, we've, we've quoted him uh, dozens of times on this broadcast that everything that happens, even the rape of children, that's not my words, it's his, okay? That's from his website. All of it is ordained by God for his glory. So that means that hyper-Calvinism is ordained by God. Okay? So the people who become hyper and fall into this logic and losing the urgency of evangelism, they do this because God ordained them to do it. And yet here we have Piper saying, don't do that. You, you explain to me the rationality of that, because to me, it's, it's just completely A equals not A irrationality. Um, maybe you're smarter and more philosophically uh, gifted than I am, and you can see it. I guess God determined for me not to be able to see the rationality of that. I, that's the only way I can explain that. I do see how that logic would deter the missionary impulse, but it's a faulty logic, and it is unbiblical. So let's— Which we would agree, because Calvinism is unbiblical. But he's saying it's unbiblical based upon the mystery of Calvinism which is that all things are determined by God, but we're not supposed to live as if all things are determined by God. We're supposed to live as if we do make an impact and change things as it happens. And so he's saying it's illogical, not based upon it being an unbiblical foundation of Calvinism. He's saying it's illogical based upon what we punt to as a mystery, which is that we are still responsible, even though God's determining everything that ends up happening or that we end up choosing to do. Let's begin by just making sure our listeners know what we're talking about. I mean, Christie is referring to the crucial biblical doctrine of election. For example, uh, we see it in Ephesians 1, 4, God chose. That, that's the word where we get election. He elected. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So that's the doctrine of election that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. There's election, and then there's the destining of the elect. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's All right, so we've gone over Ephesians 1 quite a bit, but let's just touch on it one more time so that we can understand the context. Back up to verse 1 and 2. Very rarely do Calvinists start there. I'm not trying to say they're trying to hide this, but I, I think it really does bring emphasis to the problem of the Calvinistic interpretation when you start at verse 3 or 4. Um, notice that who he is speaking to in verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints. So he's talking to saints. 
who are the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's talking to those with faith in Christ. So I'm going to bring that down so that you can see it right there at the bottom. The faithful in Christ Jesus. That's his audience. Okay. Matter of fact, some form of the phrase in Christ is used over 10 times in just the first 13 verses, which is really one real long sentence. Okay. It's used 27 times in the book of Ephesians and over 130 times throughout Paul's epistles. This is a theme of Paul talking about being in him, in the beloved, being in him. So the question becomes is how, how are we in Christ? How do we come to be in Christ? I want to be sealed in him. I want to be in Christ. How can I have that if not through faith? Well, this is the difference between the Calvinistic reading and the, uh, uh, the provisionist or the traditionalist reading. Um, he gets to Ephesians 3 and he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, who is us? Remember what we said, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he has blessed the faithful in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So these are the spiritual blessings that God has determined or destined for those who are in Christ. That's the whole context being set up for us. And so that every spiritual blessings uh, that that God has, has, has destined for the faithful in Christ, that's that's the underpinning of what he's about to get into in verse 4. And so jumping into verse 4, which is where he started, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So us in him, let's focus on that right there. Who is he ta talking about? He chose the faithful in Christ Jesus from verse 1 and 2 before the foundation of the world that we would be what? That we would be irresistibly um, regenerated so that we would believe? That's not what it says. No, he chose those who are with faith in Christ to be made holy and blameless. And this is something he decided before the foundation of the world, that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile from the very beginning, that whoever is in him through faith would be made holy and blameless. In other words, God is talking about the spiritual blessings being made holy and blameless for who? For those who have faith in Christ, those in him, in the beloved. So the faithful in Christ Jesus, let's read it with that in context, just as he chose the faithful in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, verse 5, in love he predestined us. There's the word us again. Now, what do you read when you read the word us? The Calvinist reads the word us as he's chosen certain people chosen before the foundation of the world for no apparent reason. We don't know why he chose us. And he chose us to be adopted, meaning we, we were made to believe so as to be adopted. But that's not anywhere what the text actually says. Remember, adoption is something that we're eagerly awaiting for with the redemption of our bodies, as we see in uh, Romans 8, 23. Um, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. And so we're eagerly waiting. Why? Because it hasn't been fulfilled yet. Now, there's a sense in which um, we are uh, adopted in him, but we're waiting for the fulfillment of our adoption with the redemption of our bodies. But how do I know that's going to happen? Because God is predestined for who? For us. He is predestined, the faithful in Christ Jesus, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. And so you see this all the way through the text, but notice that in verse 13, it tells us how one comes to be in Christ. You also were included in Christ. When? When God arbitrarily picked you before the foundation of the world. No. It says you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. So there's the in him phrase again. Just the same place where he chose us. He chose us in him. So how are you marked in him? When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. So you're not marked in him arbitrarily before the foundation of the world. You're marked in him when you hear the message of truth and you believe. And God is predestined for whoever is in him through faith to be made holy and blameless, to be adopted, to be uh, conformed into the image of his son. That is what God is predestined for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that's the way we would understand that text versus the way that he just read it, obviously. It's Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Here it is again in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. No now, now, remember, his calling that he's speaking of, probably, if in reference to the apostles, you're fishermen. You're nobodies. And God has chosen the weak to shame the wise. 
This is why Jesus says, God, I thank you that you've hidden this from the wise and the learned. The, the people with the degrees and the big robes and the phylacteries hanging around their neck and everybody's coming to them and honoring them in the, in the synagogues as being men of God and all righteous and holy and good. And now you've chosen fishermen, blue collar workers like Peter, that you've, you've chosen nobodies to be the messengers through which your plan of redemption would come. You've chosen the weak to shame the wise. And Calvinists will pluck that out of its context to say, oh, look, that means God's chosen certain people to be effectually saved. Instead of the context is being written in, God has chosen the weak Jews of that day, the nobodies of fishermen, to bring a message of redemption so that all the families of the earth could be blessed. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose. So there's election. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So the point... Okay, so let's talk about boasting just for one second. Understand this. If you boast in your humility then you don't have saving humility. The Bible says over and over again, and we've gone over through many broadcasts, humble yourself so as to be exalted. God saves the humble, brings low those whose eyes who are haughty. Over and over and over again, talks about how it's your responsibility, not God's, to humble yourself. Okay, so if you boast in humbling yourself, then you did not humble yourself. That's, that's an oxymoron. It's impossible to boast in true saving humility. So the Luke 18 parable of the, the publican who falls on his face before a God and says, woe is me, I can't even look to you. And he says, this man, not rather than the other, the, the Pharisee who is praying how special and great he was uh, on the street corner, Jesus concludes it's the, it's the broken one, it's the humbled one that will walk home justified. So it is a salvific text. Now, does falling on his face earn his salvation? Well, no. If he did, then he wouldn't need the cross. It wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't need to die. He could just earn his salvation through humility. No. God, in grace, chooses to redeem that broken vessel, that humbled vessel. So he humbles himself. He falls on his face. He says, woe is me. I'm a sinner. I can't even look to you. I'm not deserving of anything. I am broken. And God says, you're justified, you're reconciled. Now, imagine that guy going back home and saying, oh man, I am so proud of myself. Y'all just look at how humble I was. I am so awesome, I am so great. It's ridiculous, okay? Nothing like that ever happens. But yet, oftentimes, you'll hear the Calvinist accusing those of us who hold to a provisionist soteriology or Arminian soteriology even, saying something like, well, these people think that they've earned their salvation by humbling themselves. And so they can boast in their humility, which is a canard and an and absolutely an insane type of argument brought against Cal, uh, non-Calvinist theology. Of God's choosing before we existed and choosing against all ordinary human expectation is to prevent us from boasting in anything but God's free grace. That's why it's called unconditional election. Okay, and so I'll use a quote, and this paraphrased quote from Austin Fisher, who wrote the book, um, No Longer, uh, the, the Young and Restless No Longer Reformed. Um, and he, he talks about how it seems to him that, that the Calvinists are, are more concerned with people boasting in their salvation, whereas free will theists are more concerned with a recognizably good God. Um, and, and I think that's so true here. It's, it's almost as if he's so concerned that people are going to boast in falling on their face and trusting in, in Christ if, if they think that that's their own responsibility. If, if you think that that's really your responsibility, that you could have done otherwise, that you're free to either uh, continue in pride or to humble yourself and to trust in him. If that's your choice, your responsibility, your freedom, then somehow you can earn or merit your own salvation and you can boast in it. Uh, that, that Calvinists are so concerned about that problem that they, they ignore the bigger problem of a recognizably good and holy God who actually means what he says when he says, I want you to come, I want you to believe, I truly love you. Um, and, and, and a recognizably good God that doesn't have to punt to the mystery as John Calvin does when he says how it is that God has ordained uh, every man's choice and desires and intentions, and yet he's still um, not implicated in the fault as, as the fault and the approver of our transgressions is, is, is 
is beyond him, that he, he, he punts to mystery, which all Calvinists have to punt to mystery on how is God recognizably good in a world where determinism is true. They don't know. Um, and, and I say that's a, that's a much more difficult pill to swallow and uh, unbiblical pill, obviously, to swallow. And we've got to continue to push back out in love and just saying, guys, you don't need this punt to mystery here. This is not something that, we, that, that is biblically supported. Um, there are mysteries within the text. Um, God's being good is not one of them. I don't think we have to punt to that mystery. Hmm. Uh, God doesn't look into the future and choose people on the basis of their meeting any conditions. We see that in Romans 9, 11, where Paul describes Jacob's election over Esau when he says, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might stand, might continue, not because of any any of their works, but because of him who calls. So God's sovereign. Okay, so again, he's using the election to service, the corporate election passages, to support individual election to effectual salvation. God's choice of Jacob, the national head of Israel, versus Esau, the Edomites, who were declared hated uh, at the end of the, the, the Old Testament in Malachi, 200, uh, like 1,500 years after uh, they were born, so it's long after they're dead, that he declares his hatred. And it's not arbitrary for no apparent reason. He's declaring his hatred over this nation, which is often referred to the, by their national head, because they attacked Israel. Okay, So he's using that passage out of context to say, oh, look, God individually chose Jacob to be saved unconditionally and not Esau. There's no evidence that Esau wasn't redeemed. In fact, there's several passages of Scripture that seems to suggest that he could have been redeemed. And we can look at other people. Um, look at the other brothers of Isaac. Were they all condemned to hell because they weren't chosen to carry the lineage? Even James White in our debate admits, well, we don't know that. We don't know their individual salvation. Okay, so then electing Isaac doesn't necessarily mean um, that he's been chosen for salvation to the neglect of the other brothers. It means that he's been chosen for the service. He's been chosen as a national head to be the representative for the nation by which the seed of the Messiah would come. And his messengers would come through this seed, um, not the other. Choice and call is the basis, not anything we do or perform. Now, Christie is asking why this might not lead to fatalism with regard to missions. Specifically, since everyone must believe on Jesus in order to be saved, so she, she gets that right. You, you have mm -hmm. to hear and believe the gospel, and, and, and that's based on Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him of whom they've not believed, and how can they believe in him whom they've never heard? heard, and how will they hear without someone preaching? So she's right to draw out of that the, the inference. And so she's, she's asking, since everyone must believe on Jesus in order to be saved, and since there's um, no salvation without hearing and believing, anyone who dies without hearing, she, she's right in saying, without hearing and believing the gospel, we may assume we're not among the elect. Now, think about the implications of that, okay? Think about the implications of that. Everyone who went their entire life, both post and, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he means both pre and post Christ, I'm not sure, but let's just say after Christ, just to give him the benefit of the doubt here, and say everyone who did not hear the specific news of Jesus the Messiah and come to faith in Jesus the Messiah were not loved salvifically by God. In other words, God didn't really want them secretly. Now, externally, you might say in their prescriptive will of God, yes, he wants everybody to come and believe on Calvinism, but his sovereign secret will didn't really send Jesus to die for them, didn't really want them to come in, in, in the most uh, basic sense of the word want, uh, that he truly desires their salvation in a salvific sense. Um, so that you know, Indian group that was out in the middle of nowhere, uh, hundreds of years ago, back when uh, when they had never heard the gospel, doesn't want any of them, doesn't really want any of them. Just he, he, he elected before the foundation of the world to demonstrate his wrath through this unknown little tribe in, in nowhere.
See, I, I reject that wholeheartedly. I, I absolutely think that that is, it flies in the face of the goodness and the character of God. Um, and if you want to know how I answer questions about those who don't hear or believe the gospel uh, as a whole, my book, I'm not trying to be a book hawker here, but <laughs> my book, um, uh, God's Provision for All, gets into that. And most of the material is free online here through my broadcast. If you want to sift through some of my articles or broadcast, a lot of the material is already here, where we talk about how, uh, out of the teaching of Romans 1, that all people are without excuse because there is sufficient light and revelation for anyone to come to faith in that light and revelation. Okay, and so there's plenty of resources there for you to see why that tribe out in the middle of nowhere is still able to respond to the light and revelation they've been given so as to receive more light and revelation through various means that God may have at his disposal that we may not even be aware of uh, in our limited understanding. Because there's no second chance after, after death for them to be, to be saved. So you have to hear the gospel and believe in order to go to heaven. If you don't hear the gospel and believe, you're not going to go to heaven. And if you don't go to heaven, you weren't among the elect. So Christie asks, if the people who don't hear were not elected, what's the urgency of sharing the faith with them? And I said, it's faulty logic to let this deter aggressive world evangelization. Now, why? Why is it faulty logic? Because the logic contains a mistaken inference. It infers that God did not correlate in eternity his election of a person and our evangelizing of that person. But in fact, God always correlates in his eternal decrees the election of a person and the evangelization of that person, just like he correlates events that he has decreed and the necessary prayers for those events. Hmm. Okay, the word correlates, you could just reply, you could replace with determines, okay? It's the same, same word, okay? So uh, this is the answer that Calvinists will give when, when pressed with these kinds of questions. Um, God ordains, i.e. decrees, i.e. determines the ends as well as the means which is just another restatement of determinism. In, in other words, God doesn't just determine that, that person X will be saved. He also determines that person X will be witnessed to by person Y. And so when he says correlates, what he means is God determines that person Y will evangelize person X, and that person X, having been elect, will receive the gospel. And therefore, his answer for the quandary of this lack of evangelistic certain uh, urgency is to not undo determinism, but just to restate determinism in even a more dramatic way as to saying, not only is the elect determined to be saved, but they're also determined to hear the gospel. And you, if you evangelize that person, have been determined by God to be the evangelist by which that person would come to salvation. But <laughs> the corollary is also must be true. That person who's sitting at home uh, as a frozen chosen, is doing that by God's decree too, okay? So those who take this faulty logic are taking the faulty logic because God decreed for them to take the faulty logic. I I'm sorry, guys, why is, that, why is that being accepted as just Christian doctrine? This is insane if you really begin to unpack and understand the underpinnings of it. I, I, I don't think Piper is meaning to be that way. I, I think it's just a cognitive dissonance. I don't know that he's thought through these things very well because it ultimately goes back onto God as to why people would become hyper in their Calvinism, if Calvinism is true. Now that correlation means that the decreed event won't happen without our decreed prayers. You have not because you ask not, James says. Mm -hmm. And the elect person won't be saved, now get this, the elect person won't be saved without our decreed evangelizing of that person. The Did you get it? Okay. So the elect, so the person who's been determined beforehand to be saved won't be saved if not for the person who is to evangelize has been determined to evangelize. So whether you will become a good evangelist or not, is just as determined by God as to who will and won't be saved. In other words, it's all determinism. 
It's just determinism. And uh, mixed it with a bunch of words that everybody just uh, that really loves Piper goes, yeah, that sounds real heady and theological, maybe, or does it? Correlation is fixed in God's mind. And when we contemplate the urgency of our witness, what we should feel is this. It is absolutely essential for the sake of the elect that I do my evangelism. Hmm. Now, if, if you think that's an odd way to think, listen to the Apostle Paul. Here's what he said. So notice he's acknowledging the odd way of thinking. I mean, he, I think underpinning, I think Calvinists see the irrationality of it in their system. But the reason they, they swallow the pill based upon their own testimony is because they really believe this is biblical. I, that's, this is why I, I'm not trying to be overly contentious with them. I think they really do think this mystery, paradoxal stuff is all biblical, so they just have to grapple with it. And this is the best way they know how to grapple with it. And so now he's going to go to the Bible to justify what, he's, what, what seems completely illogical and irrational, but it, what, it's what Paul teaches, so we have to just accept it. But let's just back up and say, is this really what Paul's teaching, or has he conflated the idea of corporate election and individual election to service with this imported concept of individuals being elected to eternal salvation, i.e. determinism? Let's just, let's just listen to what he says about Paul, and then let's go to Paul and see if that's really what Paul was intending to say. In 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Isn't that amazing? He did, he did not say, well, they are either non-elect or elect, and so nothing I do will make any ultimate difference. That's totally not the way he thought. Instead, he said, I do everything I possibly can to get the elect to eternal glory because God has ordained the means as well as the end, and without the means, the end does not happen. That's the missing piece in the logic that becomes fatalistic. And just Okay, so what he does is he appeals to 2 Timothy 2.10 uh, to ultimately justify the illogical sounding position he just took. Now, let's go to that passage and see if it really supports what he's saying. Back up to verse 1. You then, my son, speaking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join me with them, join with me in suffering, like the good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, that's where he first introduces the suffering that he's going through. Now, remember, at whose hands is he suffering? If not the Jewish leaders of the day who were throwing, having him thrown in prison for teaching, in their mind, a false testament, a false gospel. And they are upset at this because, remember, he used to be one of them trying to throw the Christians into prison and to stone them and to burn them at the stake and all those kinds of things. Now he's under their persecution. Now, as a Roman citizen, he, he deserves some um, protections and probably the reason he survived as long as he did because of being a Roman citizen. But he's suffering at the hands of elect people. OK, well, now, how, how in the world can you say that? Remember, the national election. God chose the nation of Israel. He chose the Jews. And they were often referred to uh, idiomatically as the elect, the, the elect lady. Um, it, not talking about an individual person chosen for effectual salvation. He's talking about this. they are a part of the elect nation, the nation of Israel. Now, just being a part of the elect nation doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be saved. Uh, for, for sure. Obviously, God chose um, the Israelites. Does that mean every Israelite was saved? Of course not. Um, so being a chosen nation under the, in the, the, the national corporate perspective does not mean that everyone who's elect is necessarily going to be saved. Keeping that in mind, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive the share of crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insights into all of this. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel. Stop there for a second. He's bringing in the fact that Jesus is a son of David. That's very Jewish language, right? So he's talking to a fellow Jew about teaching uh, um, his church there in Ephesus uh, to the 
the, the leader here, the elder here, Timothy, and saying, this is the gospel. Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David, uh, the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is, this is from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering. By Who am I suffering? To the children of David, the Israelites, the people of David. I am suffering at their hands, t bringing them their own gospel from their own Messiah. And he's suffering, being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ with eternal glory. They too may obtain. Not they too will certainly obtain it because God's already elected them anyway, which Piper points out, ironically, in support of his own perspective of don't become a fatalistic. But again, my view doesn't, uh, <laughs> doesn't uh, lead to a, a fatalistic understanding. Why? Because he's referring to the elect as the, the chosen people of Israel, the Jews. And so I endure everything for the sake of the Jews. I endure everything for the sake of my countrymen, that they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus. So I endure everything for the sake of those who are putting me under this suffering and this, this problem. The, these issues that I'm dealing with, Timothy, I, and I am enduring the suffering that I'm doing for their own sake. Now, you may think, how in the world do you know that that's what Paul intended? Read the rest of Paul's letters. We read Romans 9, verses 1 through 3, where he says, I would curse myself for, for the sake of my countrymen, the elect of God, his chosen people. Verse 4 and 5 of chapter 9. These are the ones who are chosen to be the, the, the lineage of the Messiah, carry the, the prophecies, the law. These, these are the chosen ones. These are the elect ones. And I am enduring everything for the people who are suffering. So do you see my point here? When you, when you conflate all of these things, and you, you automatically have the lenses of individual uh, election to effectual salvation. Those lenses are on. Then you read verses which are about ele uh, individual election to service and all of those corporate election passages, which are clearly about the, the national people being chosen or clearly about certain individuals being chosen to fulfill a particular purpose. And you interpret them through these lenses of supporting that God's chosen certain individuals to be effectually saved. Um, and so... I'm just hoping you see the differences, uh, kind of the duck and the rabbit perspective here that we've talked about when, when you're understanding the way that Paul is meaning this versus the way John Piper is interpreting it uh, thousands of years later. Briefly, I said that letting election deter evangelization is not only bad logic, it's unbiblical. Now, we've already seen that in 2 Timothy 2.10, but one other observation Paul saw the doctrine of election as not hindering his evangelism, but emboldening it. For example, in Acts 18.10, Jesus says to him, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Now, does he have many people in this city because he's arbitrarily chosen them before the foundation of the world to be effectually saved, i.e. the individually chosen elect people? Or does he have many people in this city who are not like Cornelius or like Lydia, who are God-fearing people who worship God but don't know the gospel yet of Jesus? See, do you see the difference between the duck and the rabbit? It's that simple. I've got many people here who are God-fearing people who love and follow me, who I know their hearts. They don't know about Jesus yet, but you really need to go and tell them because like Cornelius who worshiped me, who gave alms, who, who, who is an aroma in my sight. In other words, God's pleased by him, according to Acts chapter 10. And he brings him Peter, right? You know the story, read it. Acts, go back to Acts chapter 10. That's exactly the same thing that's happening with Paul. Paul, there are, there are people of peace in this city. There are people who fear God. They don't know about Jesus yet. And I want them to know about Jesus because upon believing upon Christ, they will receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that is, uh, that's when true relationship can begin for them. And I want them to have that relationship with me. Does that make more sense than God arbitrarily chose a bunch of people before the foundation of the world and somehow is making them into believers be with, by reasons beyond their control? It, it's, just, it's just an unnecessary um, underpinning of all of these verses. And every one of the verses that you'll bring up, you'll hear one right after another that sound Calvinistic when you have the Calvinistic lenses on. And I can go through every single one of them and just show you the other side and go, duck, rabbit, which, one's more, which, one, which one makes more common sense here? Which one maintains human responsibility and God's sovereign plan and, of redemption and, and his work and his promises? Which one makes a more rational sense? Which one doesn't lead to a logic of many people becoming frozen, chosen, and anti-evangelistic? 
Which one, which one doesn't naturally lead to a fatalistic understanding of how the world works? Which one is more tenable? Which one is more workable? You have to ask yourself those kinds of questions when, when, when trying to decide whether John Piper's interpretation is the correct one or not. In other words, my elect are here. Keep preaching. My sheep will hear my voice. I will bring them. Or Okay, my sheep will hear my voice. Another woefully misinterpreted passages of, of Scripture. Sheep, idiomatically, means follower, right? That's what a sheep does. It just follows. Those who follow the Father will listen and follow the shepherd who was sent by the Father, Jesus, right? Does that make sense? If they didn't listen and learn from the Father, then would they listen and learn from the one who the Father sends? No. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I listen and learn from Jesus, that shows, demonstrates, that I've been listening and learning from the Father, and vice versa is true. If I ignore the Son, then it's demonstrating I never listen and learn to the Father, because if I'd have listened to Abraham's teaching, if I'd have listened to the Old Testament's teaching, if I'd have been a, a fear of God like Cornelius was, if I'd been following in, in that way, then whenever the shepherd came, I would recognize his voice because I recognize the voice of Jesus because he only speaks what the Father tells him to speak, which is the theme throughout the book of John, that you refuse to follow me because you haven't listened and learned from the Father out of John chapter 6, verses 45 and following. Just, just read the text in its context and you'll see he's not saying you do not believe because you are not elect, meaning you do not believe in me because you're not a sheep, a person that I've chosen before the foundation of the world for reasons unknown, um, but, but instead you are unelect, meaning I, I don't really want you. So the reason you're not believing is because I really don't want you. And all those verses where it says I weep over you and that I hold out my hands to you all day long and that I long to gather you and you are unwilling, all those verses are just an outward display of my uh, one will of my, my, you know, my prescriptive will, but my internal sovereign will is really that I, don't, I didn't send Jesus to die for me. I really don't love you. That, that's, what, that's what Jesus is really meaning in, in John chapter 10. What? No, he's not duplicitous. He is not schizophrenic. He doesn't have these two opposing wills where he says, I want you on one side and on the other side, secretly, I don't really want that one. I didn't really die for that one. Uh, no, he's simply saying those who listen to the Father will listen to the Son. Those who follow God will listen to Jesus because Jesus is God. They're one and the same. He's speaking. I'm sorry, I get a little passionate. About it. It's just when people begin to take verses like this out of context and try to make it sound like God doesn't really want people that he's holding out his hands to, it's just, it, 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 it draws up within me this passage. Of, no, guys, don't you see? God loves these people. He's longing to gather them like a mother hen gathers her chicks under the wind. But the only reason they're not being saved is because of their unwillingness. As Paul put it, the reason they perish is because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved. He doesn't say the reason they perish is because God refuses them, or God doesn't really want them, or Christ really didn't die for them. He says because they refuse. It's their own unwillingness that leads to their condemnation, not God's unwillingness to save them or provide the needs, uh, uh, the necessary needs for them to be saved. Acts 13.48, he says this. Luke says this when he's writing about their evangelism. When the Gentiles heard the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Okay, and that verse, when plucked out of its context, again, it does sound like it's supporting a Calvinistic lens, I mean, the Calvinistic view through those lenses. But I just I encourage you, back up and read verse 46 and following, where he, he contrasts the Israelites who have, who have deemed themselves unworthy of salvation as opposed to the Jews, who are uh, to the Gentiles, who are listening. This is the same parallel we see in Acts chapter 28 we talked about, where he says to the Jews, your eyes have grown callous, they've grown glossed over, you're ever seeing but not perceiving, speaking of the Jewish people who have grown callous to his truth. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles because they will listen. What's the contrast there? Is he speaking about each individual? No, there's obviously some individual Jews who've listened. Matter of fact, in that same chapter, he says some were convinced by what he said and others would not believe. And then he goes on to condemn those who would not believe for being ever seeing and not perceiving and having hearts that have grown calloused. Otherwise, they might see, hear, understand, and turn. And therefore, he takes the message to the Gentiles so that they will listen, because they will listen. In other words, they're prone to hear this. Yes, they're, they're more likely to listen because they haven't grown calloused and hardened in their rebellious condition. That same contrast is being brought out here in Acts chapter 13. You have the people of the city, many of which are God-fearing men and women, who are prone to hear, many of, much, many of which were 
the Gentiles of that day because they were not calloused in their self-righteous religiosity like the Pharisees of that day were. And therefore, they were, uh, they were disposed to or appointed towards a, a, um, believing the gospel. Um, and when you contrast this and understand that if you're a God-fearing man like Cornelius, would, would Cornelius, prior to hearing the gospel, would you say that he would be appointed to eternal life? Why, why wouldn't you? He believed God. He followed the Father. Why wouldn't you say that God has disposed him or appointed him or, or, or he's, he's prone to, um, to believe the gospel when it comes? Because he's already believing the Father. Why wouldn't he therefore be appointed to eternal life and believe the Son when the message of the Son comes? Do you see the point? When, when you take again out of the context of the first century church and understand there are God-fearing people who truly trust in God but have not heard the gospel which is being first brought to them at this time, then you can take these verses out of their context. I encourage you to go to sociology101.com and look for Acts 13 and you'll see the verse-by-verse -verse commentary with many other scholars brought in to show how Acts 13.48 simply does not um, support uh, an individual election to salvation perspective as Piper just read it. This was the ground of the success of the preaching of the gospel. As many as were appointed unto eternal life believed, and if there had been no gospel, there would have been no salvation. Paul knew that he had been sent to do what only God could do. He, he said in Acts 26, I I am sending you, Jesus, he's quoting Jesus, or, or Luke is quoting Jesus, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That they may receive it. See, opening the eyes is by bringing light. How will they believe in one whom they've not heard? Well, how will they hear unless they have a messenger? Well, so what does God do? He sends messengers. That's in enabling the people who hear to believe. Now, it's their responsibility as to whether they're going to suppress that truth that they hear or to believe that truth. On Calvinism, that, that choice has already been made. Okay, So whether they suppress or accept the truth, that, that is a decision that's already been made in eternity by God. He's the one who's determining it. On our view, what we would say, humans are responsible for which choice they make as to whether to suppress or to accept the gospel appeal. And that's the difference between our two worldviews. They may say that's not fatalistic, that's not deterministic, that's not all those things that they want to try to avoid. I'm just saying, I'm sorry, I, I don't think the emperor has any clothes. I think A equals not A is, is the contradictory claims that you're making. And yes, I know in the Westminster Confession and other confessions that you appeal to, it does say things like, well, yeah, we, yes, we believe in determinism, but we also uh, affirm that man's responsible. And I'm just saying, I, I, I find those kinds of statements contradictory. When you say, on one hand, God determines everything, but yet men are held responsible for what God determines. I'm just saying, I, I, sorry, I don't think that that's taught in the pages of Scripture. And even though your confessions may try to maintain a sense of human responsibility, I don't think it's the biblical sense of responsibility that is clearly laid out in the pages of Scripture. And a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Only God can open the eyes of the spiritually blind. But Paul is sent by God to do it. God knows whom he will save. He knows whom he's chosen, and he knows whom he has appointed to be his instrument for the impossible opening of the eyes of the blind. So, oh, how I hope that there will be hope-filled, bold, yearning emissaries who follow the Lord into world evangelization. Amen. Really good. Thank you, Pastor John. Okay, and of course, as we said, the only time that a Calvinist will become evangelistic is if God has ordained, i.e. determined, for the Calvinistic not to take the Calvinist not to take faulty logic and to become evangelistic. And again, t tell me if, if that's not what is logically and, and true according to the claims of the system itself, then explain to me how it's not. Because I think if Calvinists do believe that all things that come to pass— are in accordance with God's divine, unchangeable decree, then hyper-Calvinism has been a part of our human history. And they don't like it. I know Piper doesn't like hyper-Calvinism, but yet he believes that God sovereignly ordained for some people to take Calvinistic's, Calvinism's understanding of the gospel and become hyper with it. And I don't know how you can rationally affirm that. I don't know how you can believe that that's a tenable way of understanding the way the Bible works and the way the Scripture works. If you simply remove the determinism of John Piper's individual 
election to effectual salvation perspective, and you go back to what we were saying and you just simply understand these two perspectives, individual election to service is either being addressed like God, I, uh, like Jesus in, in John 15, 16, um, you did not choose me, but I've chosen you. That's election to service. That's obviously speaking about apostles being elected to a particular uh, good purpose, bringing the message to the world uh, for which the nation itself was elected. Okay, And you've got the corporate election to salvation perspective, which is ultimately that in Christ, all who are in him through faith are elected or chosen uh, for that end. Now, I've, I've gone uh, to... Um, one article, I want to point out one article that I did write on that, um, that just highlights this, these things really clearly in a, in a parable. Um, I've been accused, this is out of Matthew 22, I've been accused more recently on a broadcast that I do um, parabolic theology, that I, I derive my doctrine from parables. And they'll reference articles like this or broadcasts like this where I refer to um, Matthew 22, or I referred to the prodigal son parable or something of that nature. L let, me just, let me just clarify something, okay? The fact that I use a parable to explain or to expound my exegetical conclusions doesn't mean I haven't done exegetical work above and beyond what the parable, whatever parable it is that I may be doing, okay? As you can see, I've gone through all these verses that he brought up. I'm not afraid of any of these verses. I've got article upon article and, and broadcast upon broadcast going through all of the major different proof texts for, for and against the Calvinistic understanding of theology, okay? So people who try to just dismiss what I'm arguing here as, oh, well, he's just basing it on parables. I'm sorry, if I just plucked one of your broadcasts out where you happen to use a parable to support your perspective and I didn't look at all your writings and all your other teachings and all the other stuff and I came to a conclusion, oh, everything he concludes is based upon parables? Is that a fair assessment of your view and your work? Of course not. The fact that I use a parable that Jesus gave us to explain something doesn't mean that that's the only thing I've ever used or ever will use to, uh, to support my doctrinal findings and my systematic. Um, and, and, and to suggest that all of the scholars who hold to this a similar perspective that I hold to haven't prov provided volumes upon volumes of work on all of those other different questions and passages exegetically is, is just, it, it's, it's, it's offensive when people begin to kind of take that approach, a dismissive approach to, to my, my perspective. Plus, Jesus' parable here draws a conclusion out of Matthew 22. What is, this, what is the moral of Jesus' parable of Matthew 22 and the wedding banquet? Many are called, but few are chosen. That, that's, the, that's the final kind of concluding remark he makes. Many are called, but few are elect. Now, don't you think that, that parable might be important in understanding the historical context of election and what Jesus, how Jesus might see it? I think so. You know the story, the parable, the story of, of a king with a kingdom, and he has a wedding banquet and he has servants that he's drawn out from that, that, that nation, that he gives them invitations, and he says, go give this to my people first. When they reject it, he says, go take it in, outside the walls of the city and to the highways and the byways, to the good and the bad alike, and invite whosoever will come. Then the people show up. There's someone there without wedding garments. They come to the, the wedding banquet, but they don't come prepared. And what is the king's response? Why are you, why are you here? Why are you like this? He didn't have a reply. And he, he says, cast him out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he concludes, many are called, but few are elect. Few are chosen. And this parable is a good parable to illustrate what we just talked about with the differing views of election. First, the election of the nation that the king is ruling over. Obviously, the king is representing God, right? What is the nation he's ruling over? Who is that representing? Israel. Right? Did he choose this nation because they were deserving or more moral or great or impressive? No. Deuteronomy is very clear. They were small, insignificant people. Okay? They weren't more moral or more worthy to be chosen for this noble task of bringing the Messiah and his message to the world. Okay? So God chose this nation unconditioned on their moral standing or their worthiness as a nation. But he did choose them nationally. Now, even Calvinists have to admit there's a national component in this. Many of them acknowledge that. All right. So there is a national, that's national election right there. There's a corporate perspective of election to a particular service, to a particular thing being accomplished through the nation of Israel. The second choice you see in this parable, the election of the servants. 
from that nation to deliver the wedding invitations. Okay, Those would represent the prophets like Jonah, who was taking the wedding invitation to the Ninevites, or Paul, who was taking the wedding invitation to the Gentiles of his day. Right? What happens to these people when they do this? They're, uh, well, Paul, look what happens to Paul. He's, he suffers for it. And that's exactly what happens in the parable. So is there a parallel between Paul's life and this parable in Matthew 22? Absolutely. He's one of those servants chosen out of the nation to take the wedding um, invitation to the Gentile people. He takes it first to his own countrymen, who he's willing to, uh, to suffer for their sake, because he desires their salvation, willing to curse himself for the salvation of his own city, his own people, his own countrymen. But God's sending him outside the city to go to the Gentiles and take the invitations to them, and he's, being, he's still being persecuted by his own people for doing this. Okay, so this is representing people like Paul, and that he chose them. He chose the apostles. I did not, you did not choose me, I chose you, John 15, 16. Again, that's a verse taken out of the context what's talking about the election of servants that Calvinists will often use, not always, but often use in support of election to, of individuals for effectual salvation. The third choice of that parable, the election of those who would receive the invitations and come, representing uh, the, the messengers, the, the message that goes first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Okay, so the gospel is taken first to the Jew, and then it's taken to the Gentile. The invitation is taken first to the people of the city and then to the highways and byways, all right? Now, does he, does he pick the people who are going to receive that invitation based on their morality? In other words, did, G, did the king say, hey, go take this message to people who deserve to come, okay? Go take this to the good people. Did, no, he said, go take it to the good and the bad alike. So again, another choice that's unconditioned upon the morality so he's not choosing the servants based upon morality. He's not choosing the nation of Israel based upon it being more moral or deserving. And he's not choosing the people who receive this invitation based upon their, their worth or their moral upstanding uh, condition. Okay, So keep that in mind as well. But notice that those three choices, first, those are all elective purposes of God in, in redemptive history. None of them have anything to do with John Piper's view of individual election to effectual salvation. And yet every single one of those has verses attached to it supporting these views. And yet you'll have Piper using those verses to support individual election to eternal salvation, to effectual salvation through regeneration, irresistible grace. And none of them have anything to do with that. They have to do with his election of a, of a people, his nation through which the, the Messiah would come, the election of servants, the people who bring the invitation, and the election of those who will receive that message, all based more in a corporate perspective and not based upon uh, individual worth or individual uh, um, uh, sinlessness or something of that, that nature, okay? So verse uh, uh, number four, the fourth elective purpose of God. This is where the, the, the few are elect portion of the conclusion in verse 14 comes from, okay? So the many are called, that's the first three choices. Here's the fourth choice. The election to permit those who pr are properly clothed in wedding garments to enter into the banquet. Okay, that is a choice of the king. He could have let the person in who didn't come properly dressed, supposedly, right? He could have just let him in, I guess. Um, it, it would probably have not have fulfilled the just need for atonement, but he doesn't. He chooses not to let him in. Why? Because he's not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, i.e. the wedding garments. And that is done through faith. So the few who are elect in this parable are referring to those who come to the wedding banquet prepared, clothed in the righteousness of Christ through faith. That is the parable. And there's four elective choices of God, three of which have nothing to do with individuals being individually chosen for effectual salvation, the last of which is clearly based upon not one's own righteousness or morality. Again, it's not based upon their own deserving. They already, we already know they're not deserving. Remember, he took the invitation to the good and the bad alike. So a bad person shows up in faith, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He's still immoral. He's still bad. So he's not being chosen based upon how good he is. He's being chosen based upon the righteousness of Christ who clothes him. And so all four choices are unconditional of the morality of the person in view or the nation in view or the group of people in view. But every single one of them, not one of them has anything to do with people arbitrarily chosen before the foundation of the world 
to be somehow effectually changed into a new person so that they would believe and be clothed in the right wedding garments and saved. Nothing to do with any of that. Doesn't doesn't support any of that throughout any of the text. And this is how these kinds of verses are continually over and over again misapplied. And so what I want you to understand is that when we when we begin to really unpack these different views and begin to understand that the clearest perspective may not seem clear to you if you have on the wrong lenses. If you continue to, to, to view these things from a, a, a worldview of determinism or compatibilism, as it's sometimes called, then you may continually see uh, the Calvinistic perspective. And, and it seems like the verses that they're pulling out of those, those, those contexts look like they might support them. But I'm just saying back away, go back to the context of every one of those verses and really begin to, to, to judge for yourself if that's the intention of the author. Um, in closing, let me point you back to Sotriology101.com and remind you of a few things. Um, there is a classroom link right there, and if you click on it, you will learn more about Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, a place to get an online decree, uh, degree. <laughs> decree. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, Trinity Seminary decree stuff, too. Uh, they give degrees, actually. And uh, you, I teach some courses there, and I'd be glad, glad to have you in one of our courses. If you want more information about uh, Trinity, you can go to trinitysim.edu or click on that link. Um, and, uh, and and join us in getting a higher education. We're glad to have you there. Um, there's a curriculum there. If you haven't seen this Tiptoeing Through the Tulip curriculum, I invite you to go there and click on that curriculum link, and you can find a six-week study about the doctrine of, of human responsibility and God's saving grace. Uh, and there's a printout there as well as a download that you can use for a six-week study. Um, there's also two books that you can find out more information uh, there at uh, Sociology 101, um, God's Provision for All that I referenced earlier, and then The Potter's Promise, which uh, includes a commentary on Romans uh, at 8, 28 through Romans 9, uh, as well as Ephesians 1 that we talked about, and John chapter 6, uh, and uh, much of my journey in and out of Calvinism, if you're more interested in that. Um, also there in the top right corner is the support link. Um, if you can help uh, support us in, in helping to spread the, the news of God's love and forgiveness. We need all the help we can get. Uh, if you want to become a monthly donor or a patron, click on that link or become a one-time donor. There's also information about how if you, you want to avoid the fees by sending in a check or working through Zelle. I've been told it's pronounced Zelle, not Zelle. Uh, it looks like Zelle, I guess, Z-E-L-L-E-E, -E -E, but maybe it's just pronounced Zelle. Um, and there's no processing fees uh, even for recurring payments, this, those kinds of things, if you would rather avoid the 5% processing fee and more ministry that get, more money that goes directly to the ministry um, as a tax-deductible de donation, we greatly support any help that we can get. So God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.